All right, guys. Um, <clears throat> this lecture, Age of Anxiety, is pretty broad and extensive. I'm covering a lot of things. This is really focused on uh, the cultural, intellectual um, types of events and ideas. Um, there haven't been too many FRQ questions on this. However, um, this is really important as far as covering just the material and understanding how has World War I affected uh, people. So um, it's not as much social as more upon the cultural and intellectual developments. But partially we can see how it will also represent society after World War I. Okay, so um, this actually goes into um, and past World War II because of the instability that, that just carries over. So even though it's starting off against uh, right after World War I, we'll be looking at how it carries on over. Okay, so um, a few things I want to go over is kind of to catch up. We went over Russian Revolution, and um, it's it the Russian Revolution and World War One are actually together um, in the sense where all these events are happening throughout Europe, and so um, a lot of changes have, have been happening since the end of World War One, and so. Um, we talked about how the many different uh, families are now lo no longer in power. You have the Hohenzorns in Germany, the Habsburgs in Austria, the Romanovs in Russia. All these major um, empires have come to an end. And um, the old regime of uh, these monarchs are no more. And the new up-and-coming um, types of political systems are going to be democracies. And... Um, in France and Britain, they've had democracies before World War One, and so they're going to remain democratic and uh, somewhat stable. And um, Germany eventually is going to become a democracy, and the Weimar Republic is going to be established, and we'll go into that in the next lecture in detail. Um, but then you have all these other de democracies that are being established um, that are breaking up, right? They're breaking up all of the um, major empires to have their own nation states, right? So. Um, they have gained uh, self-determination, they're independent, and uh, countries like Czechoslovakia have their own, own territories. Um, in other parts of Europe, we're going to see that uh, totalitarianism is going to come onto the rise. That's going to be our next uh, lecture, uh, where we have communist governments in Russia, right, and fascism in Italy and Germany are going to uh, be established um, going into the 1920s and 1930s. Okay, and so this is ultimately called the age of anxiety because of you know the feeling of anxiousness the the feeling that uh, everything that you thought World War one was going to be glorious wonderful victorious um, it actually disappointed you and from that point on you've never seen such massacres such destruction um, and um, it, it's it's changed the way that you've really saw how the world works and it makes you feel like in the stressed and uh, anxious state okay so people feel like they're in continual crisis they don't know when it's going to end and constantly just um, having a very um, beaten down spirit okay so a um, key word we're gonna be looking at is disillusionment keep that word in your mind that's going to be representative of everything that we are looking at in terms of the different areas um, in culture and intellectual thought okay so <clears throat> keep that word don't forget that. Okay, Asian anxiety, disillusionment, that's that's one thing together. All right, so just to give you a road map, road map of where we're going. Okay, we just covered World War One and Russian Revolution. And so coming out of it, um, there's going to be a lot of political crises in the 1920s, followed with economic depression um, in the 1930s. And eventually that's going to lead to totalitarianism and uh, dictators rising to power, right? You learned this in world history. So... Just to let you know where we came from, where we're going, how has this affected Europe, why are they on this path, and eventually we're going to see World War II happen, um, which is a continuation of the things that are unsettled in World War I. Okay, so don't forget this this kind of like step-by-step -step roadmap, the major events, okay? Um, we can't just look at Age of Anxiety as its own little niche thing in its own little box, but how it just connects where it came from and how it's bringing to the next, you know, um, time period of totalitarianism and, and these types of um, completely controlling government systems that actually were given this power, right? Okay, so um, this has been uh, an FRQ question before, 
It asks uh, for you to analyze the ways in which World War One influenced European thought in the years after World War One, before World War Two. Okay, so this is what we call the interwar period um, between uh, World War One, World War Two, about twenty years. So in twenty years, how has European thought um, been, you know, affected by World War One? Okay, so this, this, this word right the, the key term in this prompt if we want to answer which is going to you know explain kind of a lot of the things this lecture is built around is that we have to understand the thought the, of the Europeans what's going on in their minds how they think is going to be affected because of their feeling of disillusionment so remember I said this key word okay so disillusionment is going to affect their thought what is thought exactly okay it's going to be these different areas be a philosophy literature art and science okay so very much across the board intellectually and culturally these developments are happening and it's because of the disillusionment that people are are thinking a different way okay so main idea is that it's that thought is shifting um coming out of world war one because of the major event right the great war the war to end all wars unbelievable okay um the world that europeans knew have been turned upside down and they really have no control over the change and they thought that they always thought um, that the world was based upon progress and that's now it's all not true and they're disappointed and they feel like uh, their uh, development as a civilization as a society has now been stunted okay all right and then something that's a little bit separate is that even entertainment and leisure will take part in European thought but the main thing is mainly intellectual and cultural so don't take entertainment and leisure as the main representative of what European thought is. It's just a side thing that, yeah, people do think about how entertainment and leisure can kind of take up my mind because, you know, World War One is so damaging to my spirit and to my identity that I need these things to kind of keep my mind off of the destruction and terrible things that have happened, okay? All right, so the first thing we look at is philosophy. Um, before 1914, uh, most people believed still in the Enlightenment in, in thinking that rationality, right, reason and logic is something that the individual should embrace and that this optimism and having a worldview that is very, you know, positive and optimistic is because they have been seeing a lot of progress in the last two centuries, right? So um, coming out of the Enlightenment, let's think about what humans are capable of because we have the minds to do so. Um, but the, also, before World War I, there are a lot of critics that said, you know what, um, progress is not that all great in what it's cracked up to be, and the power and the rationale of the human mind, its logic, is actually not that grand at all. And so this pessimistic view actually has existed before the war. So you can imagine by after the war, right, uh, it's like a huge, you know, Ev uh, event that is evident um, before them and they're saying you know what this is totally true okay we think that we know what we're doing and instead we just kill millions of people and we think that that's a great and grand thing right our, our reason and rationale has caused us to do very irrational things like cause a war that it's upset the entire continent and uh, it's affected even the world and the entire population in Europe has been affected right because total war Right? It's a participation of everyone um, within the country, whether you're arming yourselves with a gun or not, whether you're in the military or not. Right, That's affecting everyone that's participating. Okay, So this is a representative um, image of World War One, the destruction that comes out of it. Right, A lot of times we talk about um, the causes of war and the costs of war, the effects of it, but we don't really understand like what how, how does how does war really affect our lives right how does it affect uh, uh, the the citizens lives because to be honest we have very very little examples being american right we, we hardly are ever attacked and so we don't really truly understand right so maybe we understand events like boston marathon and stuff okay nietzsche so nietzsche is a huge philosopher that you need to know um we don't need to get too deep into him but just mainly understand that he's going to be one of these pessimistic guys okay um, he's going to be a critic um, of the enlightenment he embodies pessimism and so he's going to criti criticize rationalism and saying that westerners europeans have overemphasized rationality over time and so um, a lot of the 
framework of thinking, the institutions from before, such as the, the Christian religion, the church, right, has really um, disappointed people. And so uh, in his book, Thus Spake Zarathustra, um, he blasted religion and said that God is dead. And so he's saying that Christianity is really just a um, slave morality and saying that um, it, it is talking about a human's weakness and how humans are mediocre. Uh, but he believes that individualism is actually really important and society has killed that and that each person and their uniqueness has no longer been able to thrive. Okay. Um, he wrote another book called Will to Power, and he's saying that only at this point in time, in 1888, okay, so the end of um, the 1800s, only the creativity of a few supermen, so a, a few people, are actually able to really change and reorder the world um, to actually bring it to back to what it should be, where individuals are given opportunities to express themselves. So individual expressionism is a huge thing coming out of World War One. Keep that in mind with the disillusionment. Whenever you feel very emotional, you had a very um, emotional and psychologically impressing type of experience. You feel like you want to, you know, express yourself in a certain way. It's going to come through these ideas, thoughts, and um, artistic movements. Okay. All right. So um, he becomes even more relevant after the war because of you know these things but he actually you know wrote all these things before the war okay hitler also will be influenced by him and other dictators are going to be influenced by him because they're going to take a lot of things he's going to say so let's look at some of these quotes that i've taken from nietzsche okay so nietzsche said faith is not wanting to know what is true right embodies pessimism and really trying to bring down uh, what people has have really you know invested um, their lives in and trying to really remove right old types of thinking and saying that you know all those things are going to disappoint you be yourself right you have your own individual ideas here's another one the individual has always had to struggle to keep from being overwhelmed by the tribe right the group if you try it you will be lonely often and sometimes frightened but no price is too high to pay for the privilege of owning yourself no price is too high to pay for the privilege of owning yourself, right? So don't be owned by people. Don't be controlled by people. Be yourself because it's worth it in the end, right? No matter what the cost is. Okay, last one. The surest way to corrupt a youth is to instruct him to hold in higher esteem those who think alike than those who think differently, okay? So, um... Dictators are going to be using this, right? They're going to see this, oh, right? We're going to set up, you know, youth groups. And so how can we control them, right? So you have to think like-minded. Don't be different. Don't be separate, right? Or else you're going to be an outcast. And so this is something that Nietzsche's tackling and saying that when people are just being told what to do by the masses, right, they can't be themselves. They're being controlled and they're being fooled. All right, so some pre-war philosophy. Um, let's go on and talk a little bit more about some other ideas. You have Henri uh, Bergson, who is part of the 1890s and he convinced many young people that um, it's not so much about your uh, imagination but uh, what you can anticipate what you can think about what you can rationalize but it's about your immediate experience and your intuition actually with, with that gut feeling within you more than rational and scientific thinking so it's the shifting away from you know observations experimentation understanding reality through these the scientific method, but it's about the immediate experience. What do you feel at this very moment? Okay, then you have uh, Sorel who comes up with this um, belief in called what we call syndicalism. It's it's really a manifestation of anarchism. Anarchism. Um, it's kind of along the lines of what Marx believed in that socialism would come to come to power through a violent strike and revolt of the working people. Um, this really foreshadowed the Bolshevik Revolution, controlled by an elite few. Um, and not that important. Just understand that people agree that they're seeing these things are happening on the verge of happening. And then it happens, right? And so their, their ideas are being highlighted because of their um, kind of predictions, okay? Um, all right. So then we talked about Freud, right? We talked about the, the three um, most influential thinkers of the 19th century, right? We have Marx, Darwin, and our homeboy, 
Sigmund Freud. Okay, so Freud in psychology, I don't really need to go into detail about Freud, um, but basically he talks about humans are, un are irrational, right? And um, before Freud, how, how has Freud shifted thinking in psychology in people's minds? Is that before they thought that the mind was very rational, very logical, our experiences that we perceive through our senses, right, make sense. But actually he's countering that and saying humans are greedy and irrational, okay? And by the early 1900s, it's going to become very popular. People are going to accept that. And um, Freud and Nietzsche are going to say that rational thinking and traditional moral values are too strong um, and they don't really hold value, okay? Um, what we're actually going to see is that a lot of these um, ideas are going to come and um, uh, be built upon Freud's ideas and Nietzsche's ideas are going to be emphasized even more in this pessimistic way, okay? So we have um, this idea and thinking, this value, this um, theory of logical empiricism, okay? What this means is that um, Ludwig uh, Wittgenstein came up with this, and uh, he believes that philosophy is merely the clarification, the logical clarification of thoughts. And so a lot of the abstract uh, concepts that they have, that philosophers have talked about from before, God, freedom, rights, morality, they're all senseless because uh, they cannot be tested by scientific experimentation and they cannot be, you know, calculated through math. And so um, at that point, what is true? What is making sense? Okay, it's that uh, your experiences, what you see at the very moment is what is worth analyzing. From that point on, it's really not that important because who cares of what's going to happen in the future? What are your predictions? Because the here and now is very important. Coming out of the war, you don't know tomorrow's promise, right? So think about now. Your experiences matter now. That's what you should hold to as most important. Okay, coming out of World War One and going into and after World War Two, there's this movement that is built upon all of these ph philosophies, and it's called ex existentialism. Okay, so existentialism is um, going to be really um, emphasize after World War II, but they are seeing life is just absurd, right? And it has no meaning. And the, this this meaningless feeling of life towards life and how the individual needs to find himself, right? Kind of met these people that are like, you know, super emo, don't really have any grounding, very subjective, overly emotional. Uh, what do I do with my life, right? Purposelessness. Um, th this is what kind of existentialism is saying, okay? Um, you have one major guy named Jean-Paul Sartre who uh, wrote that life had no meaning and that humans simply exist. Okay, and so I have a couple of these quotes. Man is nothing else but what make what he makes of himself. Right, right. And who are you, right? Who am I? No identity. Everything has been figured out except how to live, right? So it's very thought-provoking. Oh, wow, interesting, very deep, right? But in the end, it's it's very empty, right? It's just saying like, we know everything, but nothing matters, right? There is no more meaning, okay? Um, and so existentialism is going to kind of like disseminate and people are going to grow upon it and they're going to follow this movement, right? This intellectual movement. Um, and most of these uh, existentialists are going to be atheists, right? They don't have a grounding. They, they've, you know, left their own faith if they once because they felt like it's disappointed them, right? And so your actions are derived from personal choices and are independent from religious or political ideologies. Um, then you have actually, you know, Christian existentialists who adapt this kind of feeling, and they they you know they agree with the loneliness um, that the non-Christian existentialists feel, um, but they are emphasizing more about humans being you know sinful and how they need um, their they need their faith to ground them, okay? Um, hmm. I don't think I really need, I don't think this is that important, but some, a couple names are Soren Kierkegaard um, and also T.S. Eliot. They are the ones who are actually trying to revive uh, Christianity to be more fundamental. Um, T.S. Eliot will actually be establishing some traditional Christian framework coming out of this. And um, yeah, that's just to throw out there. I don't think it's going to be that 
huge on the AP test. Okay. All right. So other authors, you guys learn about Lost Generation, World History, James Joyce, okay, Ulysses, and the Stream of Consciousness. Why is this important? Well, in literature, okay, you have these writers that basically have said that you know what. We put out these works, and um, it's demonstrating how the war has been a terrible impact upon society. Right? We have uh, all quiet on the Western Front, and um, in the end, evidently, okay, with everything, um, they're all examples of how society has just been totally kind of thrown and thrashed, and people have kind of no grounding. Right? They're being disillusioned, and they're being disappointed. Um, and they've been let down. Okay, so um, other authors that are talking about things that are coming um, that is to come. For example, you have George Orwell with Animal Farm. He's speaking about the Russian Revolution. If you've seen the movie, okay, um, in describing this farm that's run by animals, some animals are more powerful than other ones, and that's going to represent from Lenin to Stalin and the Soviet Union take over and how there's going to be totalitarian system and communist system established in 1984. It's talking about how there's a totalitarian state and that the government is always controlled, um, in control, and they're called Big Brother. And basically it's affected people psychologically and basically humans have basically no hope at all under a totalitarian state. Okay, Then we have Anne Rand who wrote um, basically a couple books about how um, the future is going to be not utopian but dystopian okay and especially under a totalitarian government okay so um, this is kind of just portraying what is to come with a lot of these things okay literature okay now we're going to jump over to science we talked about this before um, um, hmm. I didn't mention this earlier okay but um, because of the, the age of anxiety Right, it only emphasizes Belle Epoque even more, right? The end of the century, that time where it was beautiful and things were great before the war, right? And because things are crappy and things suck right now, and it's unbelievable how things how worse things have gotten and how things have changed so much and the world is upside down. Okay? Alright, so going to that, we talked about how new physics was developed. It's much popularized after World War One, and so why is it called new physics? It's because there are things that are gonna be uncertain that are going to be discovered okay um, okay so what was once optimistic and just very rational understanding things have changed right under Einstein right the theory of relativity the theory of relativity shows that things aren't um, always rational and structured that is based upon objectivity but it's more relative depending upon where you are okay and so uh, Werner Heisenberg is going to be uh, the guy that comes up with the principle of uncertainty and he's saying that it is impossible to know the position and speed of an individual election and so it's un, uh, impossible to predict its behavior. So this has to do with kind of your position and where you stand is b basically relative to something else, right? Um, so things are not for certain and because this principle of uncertainty is happening in science is also representative of how people are feeling uncertain about a lot of other things throughout the world, especially of their trust in, you know, their structures and their, their ways of thinking. Okay, so the impact overall of science and the new physics is saying that the new universe seems to be very um, uncertain, right? It seems very troubling and strange how it's now relative whereas before they understand oh you know like heliocentric we understand how everything is it's very objective right but now it's really dependent upon the observer's frame of reference and so because it's very unstable their way of thinking and frame framework is you know kind of confusing and it's physics is no longer just easy and optimistic right and they have a lot of questions now okay um jumping into art now okay so um, I'll play some music from this point on, so give me a sec as I play in the background uh, as I go over to this. Hopefully, uh, you know, set the mood and you can understand and it adds to the whole feeling and ambiance, okay? Okay, so music's playing. At this point, um, new types of music are going to be developed. You have Igor Stravinsky, who is going to be a really important composer, and he... Um, creates the Rite of Spring, which is experimenting new tonalities. And um, for those of you guys who don't really know music, basically there are tones, right? Some are 
naturally, okay, uh, very harmonious to our ears. It sounds good. The melody, yeah, we like it, right? It's catchy, right? But then it becomes to the point where music is going to be more dissonant, okay, dissonant, where it doesn't, it's unharmonious and um, it's going to sound very aggressive and it's not going to feel as clean in terms of all that kind of stuff, okay? So that's representative of how they feel, right? Okay, then you have Arnold Schoenberg who comes with a 12 tone technique. Uh, it's, you don't really need to know in detail how this really is, but um, it's going to basically be very abstract, right? It's going to be very extreme, try to ex be a very expressive of their inner feelings. That's the main thing you need to know, okay? All right, other forms of art, you have Picasso, okay? So we all have seen Picasso's works. Uh, we can go into, you know, you know, 30 minutes Picasso, but let's focus in on what's really important. For Picasso, okay, he develops the uh, technique of cubism, right? It's basically uh, complex geometry, zigzagging lines, sharp angles, planes are overlapping, like what the heck is going on? It's very weird looking, right? And so um, mainly cubism is trying to show um, different perspectives kind of all at the same time. This is called Guernica, and it's a really important piece because a lot of APR tests have thrown it on as a question, so pay attention, okay? Guernica is a village in Spain, and um, he's trying to portray how a Spanish city was bombed by uh, Adolf Hitler's Air Force called the Luftwaffe, and so this was during the Spanish Civil War. What? Why is uh, Hitler in Spain? It's because he's supporting uh, Franco um, in. We'll get there, okay? Francis Franco in the Spanish Civil War, and so this is showing kind of the death and destruction and the chaos, right? That's coming out of the village and all that kind of stuff, okay? So one of the major arts of um, pieces of age of anxiety that's showing the suffering and death coming out of it, okay? And then we're going to look into a little bit more abstract art, okay? Then we have Dadaism. Dada is a basically nonsensical word. It's not even a real word. It's Dada, right? It's like when a baby screams, okay? So um, it's it's uh, representing the post-World War I world that didn't really make much sense. And so it's attack, attacking kind of the standards and behavior of of what is the status quo, what's normal, right? Like, whatever is normal, let's just do the complete opposite, right? Let's just be the most random, weirdest thing ever, okay? So we have Marcel Duchamp. Uh, he's going to be leader of the Dadaism movement, and then Hannah Hosh is also going to be uh, contributing through photo montages. So here you have the fountain, which is on the left. And what is that? That's a urinal, okay? And so, okay, personal, personal thing. I don't like abstract art because I feel like it's very weird, okay? The fountain, the fountain. Sorry for the artists, okay? I, I know you're offended right now, but forgive me. This is a public bathroom urinal, and it's called the fountain as a way to kind of mock traditional artists and saying, ah, this is art now, right? Cool. Then we have uh, this um, painting of the Mona Lisa, L-H-O-Q-Q. -Q. You throw a mustache on a beard, Mona Lisa, it becomes art, right? You just make things more weird abstract you twist it a little bit and becomes this whole new meaning and message right okay then we have a separate artistic movement coming out of dadaism it's going to be surrealism okay so remember humans are irrational surrealism is going to be emphasizing on freud's emphasis on dreams so a lot of these things are very in a much a dreamlike state okay this is by salvador dali i've got to write his name on the slide make sure you write that name salvador dali huge 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 name Surrealist art is all based upon him. The music is now at this point so dissonant that I'm going to turn it off because it's annoying me. All right. Peace. Thank you. Okay. Um, this one's called Persistence of Memory. You guys have maybe call them in the melting clocks or something like that. Okay. This one's in 1931. Um, surrealism is trying to take inner expression, things that are surreal, ordinary things that are kind of like emphasized and exaggerated to be showing a different meaning, okay? The Visage of War, okay? This is another piece by um, Salvador Dali, talks about the face of war, right? Look at this, right? What can we say about, the fa about war itself? Says it all, says it all, okay? Other Dali pieces, he's gonna like complete like 60 pieces in his whole lifetime, worldwide, known very popular famous artists okay all right let's end this then we have 
new technologies that are going to be important because coming out of the 1920s, 1930s, these things are going to be part of um, society. Okay? So you have movies which are motion pictures, and um, here I have Char Charlie, uh, Charlie Chaplin, Chaplin, uh, Charlie Chaplin. He's um, going to be an actor, the king of the silver screen in the Hollywood in the 1920s. But it's not just in America, right? So we have Hollywood, and that's what kind of you know makes its big debut. But uh, movies are going to be used for indoctrination in, in many of the uh, totalitarian states, such as Germany, okay, um, and also in Russia, okay, and they're going to use it to kind of, you know, control their people because, you know, you watch a movie, right, it gets you a certain feeling, it gets you a certain idea, it gets you to think, right, and so you see the image, you're in this dark place, music's playing in the background, images are flashing, the plot line's trying to tug at your heart, okay, your pulse is racing a little bit, right, in some of these thrillers, and so it really does a lot. Motion pictures do a lot, and so this is also going to be the main entertainment of the masses after World War II, um, but as an indoctrination tool, you have uh, Sergei Einstein, who's going to uh, dramatize a communist view of Russian history. And then you have Lenny Riefenstahl, who's going to uh, directing uh, The Triumph of the Will, which is a propaganda film of a Nazi youth rally in Nuremberg, Germany. Hitler is going to be coming out of the clouds, great savior of the world. And Germany's going to buy it, okay? And that's what's going to happen through through movies, okay? And then we have radio with Marconi, who develops this wireless communication in 1901. What is radio really used for? Well, it's used for by the government in World War I for military purposes and fighting, right? Instead of, you know, sending a guy on a horse with a little note, right? You can just radio it in. Um, and so it's not until after World War I where you have major public broadcasts. And uh, for the most part, it's going to radio is going to be controlled by the government, except for in the United States where it's going to be privatized. Um, the main point is, you know, a company like BBC, okay, it's going to be established. Uh, British Broadcasting Corporation is going to be established, and um, it's going to be used for political propaganda early on, especially by the dictating um, the states, totalitarian states, okay, of dictators. All right, I know it's a lot, but I hope we understand kind of disillusionment and how it kind of disseminates throughout the different areas, right, of European thought, okay? Go back to the essential question. Think about it. Do you understand it? Okay, good. Okay, quiz tomorrow from World War One until now.